The Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not all legal activities. Listen responsibly. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. So my name's Max, and I'm joined by Flynn, and our special guest Flynn is back and will be joining us for this week's episode, as well as next week's episode. He's just completed his thesis for his honours degree. So, Matt, why don't you talk to us a little bit about that, Flynn? Oh, well... I'm not sure how many of you have done a thesis, but for those of you who aren't really familiar, it's pretty much just a, you got to do a research project in your last year of uni. I did it for my honours. And yeah, I just finished it up today, wrapped up my presentation, submitted the report yesterday. And yeah, it was on a, a pretty cool topic. We, we were exploring using uh, weak supervision and data programming in labelling YouTube videos as to whether they're scam baiting or not. Many of you may have heard of scam baiting. Yeah, it was pretty cool. We used a tool called Snorkel, which is sort of like a human-friendly AI classifier labeler tool. And yeah, it got pretty good results. And the real question is, Flynn, are you glad it's over? Yes. <laughs> very. I'm so relaxed. Nice. Oh, very good. Well, let's start off and um, get into a popular demand topic on antivirus. So we've had a few people ask, Okay, well, you're doing the security podcast. What do you recommend some antivirus that we use? And I've said the same thing a couple of times and kind of mentioned it when talking about it, but I thought we'd sort of set it in stone here. My general consensus and my recommendation for antivirus is you don't need any massive third-party software like Malwarebytes or McAfee or Avast or any of them. Windows Defender, as long as you keep your computer up to date, Windows Defender is basically all you need. It's really good. And in this point in time, Windows Defender is going to pick up 99% of the threats you're going to go through. And however, if you're worried about, okay, maybe I have a virus on my computer, maybe I need to check, install Malwarebytes. It's free. Just run the free version of it and just do a spot check. So just install it to your computer, run it through, run the spot check through. And once it's completed, see if there are any dangerous files. And if there aren't any, then just delete it. Or if there are some, delete those dangerous files and then just delete the software off your computer. It is quite interesting how much it's changed over the past couple of years. I think if you were to suggest to someone to just use Microsoft Defender three years ago, they might be at your throat. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it really has improved a lot over the past couple of years. I've also been looking into solutions. Uh, you do need a pretty advanced Microsoft license. I think you need like E5, which is like the highest license you can get, but it was basically an AI solution. I think it was, uh, it was, it was an end of endpoint antivirus, of course. I think it's called like XDR. I'll have to look into it more, but basically it was an AI solution where a lot of, a lot of antivirus tools look at specific file types and then they'll look in like for patterns. But obviously if you're a sophisticated attacker, you're not going to be using these recognizable patterns. Whereas this solution that I'll have to kind of look into a bit more. It basically just looked at all file types as if they were equal and then they would look actually through the code to see if there was anything malicious in there. I haven't tested it myself. I'm going to be over the next couple months to see how effective it is. But I suppose I'll update everyone in a future episode of how good it is. Yeah, it sounds good. So the landscape for uh, antivirus has changed over the years. Would you say you're going to, like Max, would you say you're going to be keeping your eye on actual third-party antivirus given that it's been changing? Yes, yeah, definitely I'll be keeping my eye on it. But from right now, my perspective is that you don't really... You, there's nothing out there that is really using AI really well or has a good enough, enough privacy kind of policy or has effectiveness that's good enough that's going to beat out getting Microsoft Defender and then just doing spot checks intermittently yeah. or periodically. Yeah, I kind of hold the same view. I know Bitdefender's good. Yeah, right. They're, I mean, they, I think that, and it's point, better than nothing. There's some. Yeah. They're all somewhat redundant. Like you only, you only need one, and then you're mostly covered. And yeah, unless it's McAfee, still. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, course. And I, I was talking to Flynn the other day about a similar solution and sandboxing. If you're ever going to be potentially doing something dangerous, like if, for whatever reason you're now getting the dark web, don't use your normal desktop. Use a VM. A uh, virtual machine. Yeah. And uh, just sandbox stuff, which is basically you make a separate environment that you got to run this file or whatever inside or so. If it is malicious, 
unless it's an extremely sophisticated virus, it's going to stay within there and it's not going to infect your main computer. Yeah. I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, but I think my latest and primary solution to antivirus now is just using Linux. Linux, yeah. yeah. No, uh, it, fi- it fixes all. I don't know how relevant that is for everyone. <laughs> I would suggest if anyone does want to up their security, look into Linux or... I don't. I mean, it, it comes down to common sense before anything. That was a bit of... Yeah, but it is. It is it's a it's, topic for another it's, episode. <laughs> and operating systems, which ones are good? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, yeah, it really is good. Right, so just to sort of sum this up before we move on, if you're an organization-wide, like if you're looking for an antivirus, then that's a completely different story. That's You're going to probably need some kind of extra level of surveillance and control over those computers. Yeah. Whereas for personal use, generally, Microsoft Defender, if you're using a Windows user, spot checking, if you feel like you've been susceptible for something, spot checking with just a, a free antivirus and then deleting it once you're done with it, that's pretty much the way to go. I would say, uh, yeah, naming them by name, McAfee, Avast, or any sort of paid antivirus you have our full permission i suppose to go go ahead and delete those it's worth mentioning as well that they can be very difficult to delete that's by design so there some people will say that antiviruses are just as bad as actual viruses i found mcafee especially is um that tends to be true if you're having that kind of issue where you can't find an uninstall exe in the files for it google your antivirus and then uninstall and most providers will have a tool that lets you uninstall their software. So McAfee is is really known for being impossible. Just a couple of years ago, I think it was probably 2016, 2017, finally from Community Outcry, they released a tool that will wipe it from your system. So you won't get those annoying ads popping up anymore. You're not going to get pop-ups and annoying things telling you to renew your subscription. Cool. All right. Well, let's talk about the Optus outage. That's the big hot topic at the moment. And as well as the cyber attack on DP World. Now, DP World is a porting company that controls a very large amount of supplies coming in and out of the country, so imports and exports. They were hit with a cyber attack that shut them down for an entire day, and some of their systems are still um, yeah. struggling to come back online now. Sorry, I missed that. Did you mention it was 40% of Australia? Yeah, about 40% yeah. of... It was 40% of either shipping imports and exports or overall imports and exports. I think it was just shipping. But still, it's a huge, huge stakeholder in Australian imports and exports and really our connection to the outside world when it comes to freight. So that being attacked is a a real, real doozy. Bit of an unrelated topic. Because of that, maybe do your Christmas shopping now. (laughs) <laughs> Actually, that's a real good point. Do your Christmas shop. Oh, it might later. be too late by the time this comes out. But <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. There are analysts saying, and you know, we can't, we don't know how much we're going to trust a market analysts, but they're saying that Christmas prices could actually start soaring, and there could be a run-on effect caused by the shipping delay. So get your Christmas shopping done early. Yeah, but I think this really highlights a massive issue with critical infrastructure, and business continuity in general, so risk management from a large scale. Obviously, the Optus outage and the DP world are a bit different just because one's a cyber attack. Yep. But um, the Optus outage really highlighted some cases where they weren't even prepared for something like this. So what we know now is that apparently there was an upgrade to the routing information, which basically caused propagated throughout the whole Optus network, which basically shut everything down. They had to reboot physical devices. That's what we know right now. We don't understand where was the redundancy here. Or if there was any. If there was any redundancy, you would hope there is for Optus yeah. being the second biggest telecom in Australia. But realistically, it looks like a an upgrade of, of some kind of routing information caused their entire network and their, all of mm. their routing table information to com- be susceptible and taken down completely, which that is a humongous single point of failure. Yeah. <laughs> have an upgrade to peering information then if that's able to take out your entire network that's a a big problem yeah big problem something that we have seen quite a lot is a general misunderstanding about redundancy and business continuity i've seen companies that say like oh we have backups and redundancy and it's within the same data center Mm. 
Like that's not a good way to do redundancy. If your what redundancy happened? is in the same data center, what if there's a file? What if there's that goes down? Or, yeah. um, it just doesn't make sense. I don't think a lot of people are doing redundancy right. Yeah, and I think a lot of people aren't taking it seriously. That you know, what if your backups do go down? One time we did see somebody where we ran an exercise with them, and they basically just said like it would never happen that the backup would go down. You know, you, those things can happen. Exactly. Yeah. You can have all the right controls in place, but regardless of that... One in a million is going to happen one day. Yeah, exactly. So you need to be prepared. Having the appropriate disaster recovery measures and I guess in Optus's case, <laughs> having some change management there fixed. Yeah, change management is also a massive problem. From what the article we read, it was something about international peering. We don't know if that was Optus themselves or if that was a third party, but... If there was proper change management in place, you would hope that at least it's, you know, people have reviewed it and tested it before it goes to these routing tables, bef- and which would start it up. Even even in the case that they, it, it's not out of their control to change it, there's some level of fallback that they have where they can still have appropriate routing set up so that their, their coverage isn't completely destroyed by an upgrade. Yeah. Right. I mean, change management is done so poorly so often as well. I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years back where apparently a Facebook intern made something go live and then just Facebook was completely fried. Like, how does that even happen? Yeah, that's um, unreal. Something that Max showed me before this as well is that Optus is now getting more scrutinized by the government where they're saying they will now review their cybersecurity controls for critical infrastructure, and in which my immediate response is, how is this not a thing already? Yeah. Going back to what we said in, I think it was the first or the second week, is Australia's security is so far behind. How is this not already a thing? Yep. You know, we have companies like insurers and financial institutions which have to follow APRA, and I don't understand how this wasn't being done, how the government wasn't reviewing Octus's network. Well, there, there's also a bit of a, a conundrum here where on one end... The government's saying we need to have more controls in place so that regulators are able to treat Optus and telcos as critical infrastructure and have closer reporting to them. And you say, okay, well, one, why wasn't that already in place? Insurers already have to be compliant with APRA. APRA. Oh, compliant. 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 But, yeah. but there's already supposed to be this communication in place for financial institutions, right? Now you can say, okay, well... One, why wasn't that in place on their end so that they were already talking to them? Two, why were Optus in a position where they're they're not talking to the government? Yeah, it's really confusing to me. I'm sure this story will unfold more as in time. I find it hard to believe that the government wasn't even keeping an eye on them at all. Like, it just doesn't seem realistic to me. But yeah, it really just shows a downfall in as we said redundancy change management business continuity in a nutshell and you know it really like a lot of businesses could not function which is also a lesson for businesses some of these were small businesses so you can't really blame them but you know if you're relying on one network and if that goes down that's your whole livelihood you need to have some sort of way that you're going to work around also just completely left field topic is it goes to show that We are not ready for a cashless society. No, definitely Um, not. So many businesses basically could not take uh, cash at all over the 12 hours that Optus was down. I would definitely say take cash if you can. (laughs) I'll have that option. Have multiple controls in place. So, you know, have a way so that if Optus is down, you can go to Telstra or a different network entirely. Yeah. Um, So interestingly, Vodafone and Telstra are both and some other small telcos were reporting massive sales on their e oh it's cool and their even their physical prepaid sims that was a that was even a may sim which i haven't heard from that in years and <laughs> sort of thing about them yeah it really did show a big failure in one of the biggest companies in australia and everything went to a standstill um there was this bit morbid but uh there was a case where someone basically said that they missed the passing of their mother because yeah. they couldn't contact them emergency services were down like it's a massive deal and this heavy reliance on this one network it goes to show that we aren't prepared to you know move towards 
as I said, a cashless society or society that's based off one network. It's just not feasible right now. No, nah, no, definitely not. And well, if we bring it back a little bit to the DP world attack, that's um, that's many would consider that a critical infrastructure. As oh, well. of course, yeah, it's shipping and freight. So, you know, two big outages of critical infrastructure in what was within a week. You know, something really needs to be done to make sure that there's there's appropriate. Um, measures in place so that this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Seems to be happening all at the same time. You know, got we got Medibank and Optus around the same time. Now we got these two um, outages around the same time. Yeah, maybe there's a big conspiracy in the background. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. So I thought it would be useful to bring up some one of the approach that I don't know the exact validity. I know the U.S. government's quite kind of tight with this stuff, but there's there's certain talk online about how they went about their critical infrastructure upgrades, which was, this is about probably around four or five years ago. So in nuclear power plants, energy grids, anything they considered critical infrastructure, they sent lots and lots and lots of pen testers, lots of ethical hackers to go in and just beat up the systems for a couple of years. And they were paid absolutely ludicrous amounts of money to, to do this. And in the end of it, even though there's been a couple of attacks here and there, um, the US has a pretty airtight sort of infrastructure. I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. I'd, I'd say the Colonial Pipeline incident wasn't exactly that's, an attack here. For later. That's that's one sort um, of example versus how many have we had? Yeah, exactly. But um, the... yeah, I mean, America's had its own problems as well. But even as you said, they've gotten pen testers to do it. But the Optus outage wasn't even well, as far as we know, it wasn't a cyber attack Ooh. and. Yeah, it's just these things happen, but uh, you kind of have to sit back and say, well, why did this happen? Why is this happening with the second largest telco in Australia? Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Either the reporting to the government was either poor it was, or not existent, <laughs> right? Yeah. And on, tel- on Optus' side, so yeah, they either weren't reporting it to the government, the government wasn't following them up, wasn't having things in place to check in on them, or at the same time, Optus wasn't doing the right thing for its backups. Yeah, and and for their for their change management and for being ready for updates like this, and you'd assume that peering changes, right? That they have to happen to every single telco, and they're going to happen, yeah, at some point. So why did this happen to Optus? Why did it happen to them, and why were they unprepared for it? One thing I'll quickly go over because we may be short on time is the importance of transparency with security and, and in general. We recently saw an incident. With our solar winds, so solar winds around the same time as the Colonial Pipeline, I believe, basically had a massive cyber attack. Recently, the Sizer was charged with fraud, which has been a hot topic because you know some people are saying like, "Well, he's kind of been chucked under the bus," which is kind of fair because board recognition is really important. It should just fall on the Sizer. But that being said, I did see some text messages that basically showed that. The Sizer was aware of certain issues and just was not selling them. He was basically, from yeah. what I saw, he lied to a client saying that he had certain things in place. And having that transparency, now, obviously, we're not saying that hap- that's happened at all with DP World or Optus, because mm. there's no way we could possibly know. But being honest with what you have in place is critical, because if you're not, when something happens, it's going to bite you in the ass. Yeah, exactly. And otherwise, do you get you know charged with being negligent? Oh well, yeah, well, you get charged with the, with fraud, <laughs> fraud as well. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. There, of course, there are parts of that story which we don't know yet, and I'm sure they'll come out in time when that court case goes over. But yeah, you really do have to be transparent with what you have in place. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.